And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you um, here in Tulsa, Oklahoma on a warm spring day. What I'm going to be talking about today is assessing U.S. oil security as world oil markets change. Uh, then this work is partially derivative of work that I did with Hill Huntington last year. And uh, even though it doesn't say so on the slide, if you don't like anything, you can blame him. It was from the old stuff. <laughs> so what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the idea that oil price instability raises concerns about oil security. I'm going to take a little bit narrower approach than David Green in that I'm going to be concerned about oil security, not all of the economic costs that might be associated with oil dependence. And we're going to look at the fact that world oil markets are changing, and we're going to look at sort of how does the security question change as the world oil market changes. And there's new sources of crude oil production outside of OPEC, notably places like Brazil. There's growing use of non-petroleum liquids, such as ethanol. And OPEC, particularly Saudi Arabia, has said that it may maintain less excess capacity in the future. So how do these developments really affect oil security? So this is kind of what I would sort of say is the whole idea of oil security comes from something that David mentioned in his response uh, to Cynthia in that the economic costs of oil supply disruptions can be kind of seen here. Uh, if we look at the last 11 recessions the United States had, which are shown here in the gray bars, uh, 10 of those recessions were preceded by sharply rising oil prices, shown in red. And here I'm using Jim Hamilton's measure of sharply rising oil prices. So you can see each of our, you know, 11 of our, we've had 11 recessions since World War II. 10 of them have been preceded by sharply rising oil prices. Now, some of those episodes were pretty small, which may be the reason that Jim likes to put the oil prices in nominal terms rather than real terms. Uh, nonetheless, uh, these are events which have led people to think there's a relationship between oil consumption and economic dislocation. So what are the dimensions of oil security? There's the instability of oil supply and volatile prices. Uh, there's the question of U.S. dependence on oil imports. Foreign policy concerns that arise from that and security externalities associated with oil use. Both consumption and looking at the question of imported versus domestic sources. And do changes in oil market uh, conditions really going to change the way we look at oil security or oil security concerns. Now one of the things I want to do first is kind of look at it a way that economists don't look at it. We're going to look at foreign policy implications of U.S. oil dependence as seen from the political point of view. And this is according to the Council on Foreign Relations. This is really a study conducted by David Victor, which came out in about 2006. And the first one is simply that a significant disruption in oil supplies will cause economic and political dislocation, and that has a cost. That probably has an economic dimension to it. High prices and seemingly scarce supplies create fears that there will be disruptions, and there may be an economic cost associated with that. Now, the fact that oil exporting countries have access to revenue as a result of their oil revenue is something that political scientists see as a problem, people in Washington, D.C. see as a problem. Basically, this is the Hugo Chavez bullet. Uh, we don't like countries that misbehave uh, because and the fact that they have oil allows them to thumb their nose at the United States. Uh, 
This, I would argue, doesn't really have an economic dimension for a couple of reasons. First of all, if we reduce our oil imports by one barrel, that's not going to have much impact on Hugo Chavez. The other one is that we typically separate the sources of a country's income from its behavior. We don't think about them as one facilitating the other. Now, the, another issue sort of seen from the political point of view, and you can kind of see this in the relationship between Italy, Italy and Libya, or between the UK and Libya a couple of years ago, where there's this kind of view that there's going to be political realignments around the world that we don't like as a result of relationships between countries like Libya and Italy, where they, you know, they trade a lot together. You know, Italy imports a lot of oil from Libya. They're reluctant to uh, do what the United States wants, the Italians were, as if they needed Libya as an excuse. But I would argue here this is not really something that you know, our reducing oil imports from Libya ha would have much impact. Uh, or even our re reduction of foreign oil consumption is going to have much impact because it's the Italians that are importing the oil from Libya. They're the ones with the relationship with Libya. So I don't see there being a cost to the United States, and I don't see there being... Uh, it's also the case that if you reduce the consumption by one barrel, that it would have any impact. And finally, this is kind of the revenues from oil and gas uh, wells can un undermine local governance, create instability. Uh, I thought this bullet was about Texas and Oklahoma, <laughs> uh, or maybe Tony's Alaska. But uh, you know, there's some indication that there's been disruptions uh, uh, in the Middle East as the result of unequal distribution of wealth that resulted from uh, oil income. And so there, again, is some potential here. Again, I would make the argument that a re small reduction in U.S. consumption isn't going to have much impact on this. And finally, the United States wouldn't have to take a military, have a military posture in the Middle East if it didn't import so much oil. This is something that Cynthia and David discussed just a little bit ago. And what I would point out a couple of things is, first of all, our military posture in the Middle East is a policy response to a perceived cost. So if there's a cost, that we should measure the cost directly rather than the cost of our policy response. So this shouldn't be added to other policy response. And I would also point out that if the United States were to reduce its oil consumption by one barrel, I don't think that we would have fewer aircraft car carriers in the Middle East. It's a question of how much we would have to reduce it to reduce our military posture. Now, Darwin Hall uh, has produced some estimates of the cost of military presence in the Middle East on the basis of taking the our foreign expenditures in the Middle East prior to uh, the second Iraq war and dividing the total number of barrels that we import by those military costs. But I don't think that that's a very good measure of this variable. And it's a policy response to a different cost. We shouldn't count it along with the first bullet. So let me move on to the economics of oil security. Oil security is really reducing the vulnerability to oil supply disruptions. And disruptions in world oil supply lead to episodes of sharply rising oil prices and reduced GDP. It happens not only in the United States, but it happens around the world. Uh, and the world market includes suppliers that have been historically unstable. Some of those are members of OPEC. And the United States relies on an integrated world oil market. And because the United States relies on an integrated world oil market, uh, 
all the prices move together. The price of WTI, as uh, Robert pointed out, and the price of Dubai eventually move together. So cha do changes in the oil market conditions change our security concerns? So first of all, let me just show you here that world oil prices generally move together. Here we have Bonnie Light, uh, Brent, and WTI. And you can see that these oil prices move very well together. And if we used a much longer time period, you might even be difficult to see that they weren't really just one uh, price plotted. So all of these prices move very well together. This means that there's no source of oil that we can consume which, uh, where we're not exposed to price variability. So even if we retreat and produce all of our oil domestically, uh, reduce our consumption to where we get down to the point where we're not importing any oil, our prices are going to move with world prices because it's an integrated world market. So there's no price secure supplies. But there is still a reason to distinguish between domestic and imported oil uh, in this integrated world oil market. Domestic sources and some sources outside of the United States have been historically stable. Now, if Texas secedes, maybe that will turn out not to be true. Uh, but domestic sources are relatively stable. And this means that if we increase our cons production of domestic sources, we're increasing the share in the market that is captured by more stable production. Non-US oil production contains unstable elements. And so even though consumers may not be able to distinguish between supplies, policy can. Policy can sort of say domestic production is more secure than imports. And if we shift toward domestic production, we are going to have more secure oil supplies. And in fact, unstable oil production varies from the point of view of the United States with non-US production. So what's the economics approach to looking at oil security externalities? Well, as uh, David pointed out, changes in the terms of trade for imported oil during or not during the disruption, that's really not a security issue. That's an income transfer issue, and it's not an externality. Transfers during a disruption, this is partially an externality because the amount of oil that I consume can affect how much of a transfer one of you pays. 